When I was a kid, if you wanted high fidelity, you'd get yourself a record and there was information encoded in that groove and that needle could pick out that information and you could have rock and roll. But see, records were this big around. The problem with that is you can't put it in your backpack and you can't jam out with it like that. Portable record players were not designed to be worn on your shoulder. So they developed these things called cassette tapes and then the cassette tapes were like this small and you could put them into a record, but the sound quality generally sucked. There was a little bit of hiss on top of it. But in 1990, see my sister, I have a big sister, and my sister bought a CD player, and that was awesome, and CDs look like this. See all those pretty colors? You see those colors? Dang! So we kind of want to see why those colors are there, and we also want to see how a CD can hold information, because a CD is holding information in ones and zeros, because you know like a few years ago you'd get a CD-ROM drive for your computer, and the CD-ROM drive could store a picture, and that picture is like one, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, 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 zero, zero, one, one, zero, whoa, skipped a one. Yeah, so that's the picture inside of a CD, and we want to know how that CD is storing that information. We want to know how it can be so incredibly dense, because this is a textbook, student edition on CD-ROM. Dang, on a piece of plastic. That's pretty cool, right? But then, see, it's, it got better. People were like, we could make movies out of this same storage medium. And I've got myself a movie on a, look at this. That's an enormous CD, exactly the same storage technology as a CD, but they just made it bigger and they called it a laser disc because it's really cool. Like what if you shined a laser on it? Watch this, yeah. All kinds of awesome things happen. In fact, there's actually, well, see all the multiple dots? That means there must be some kind of diffraction. Guess we can do that with a CD too. Let's try it, can we? Look at all those dots. Yep, probably diffraction going on there too, yep. What about, uh, ooh, and then they said, wait, wait, we could put the dots even closer together. And then they got these things called DVDs. And these guys might have even more diffraction because the dots are closer together. Wow, there's so much diffraction that I can only see two dots at a time. And if you got me a Blu-ray disc out here, wow, look, I can barely see those three, almost. If you got me a Blu-ray disc, you'd probably only be able to see one dot at a time. Whoa, that's cool. Did you see all of those at one moment? I think I'm just in the middle I'm doing some really interesting stuff. Okay, so that's fun. Play with lasers sometime, but I don't want to bore you. Um, the point is, Optical storage is incredibly cheap. You can make it with plastic and you can seriously buy these things for 10 cents a piece. If you're paying $15 for a CD, you're probably paying some other people rather than the plastic manufacturer. So here's my point. This is how we read information on a CD. I want you to pretend that you've got a laser and if it's a CD, that sucker is a red laser. And so you've got light coming down, pew, pew, like this and you're scanning the surface of the CD. But on a CD, you may find that there is a bump. But notice that that bump is not a problem right now. But lo and behold, the CD surface is moving this direction. So you got light coming down, and you've got ray one and ray two. Notice we're always comparing one ray versus another ray. Ray one and ray two, when they bounce off, let's say they bounce off, they're still gonna be red. Uh, but I don't really wanna draw them red, sorry. Still red, but they're going to be coming up like this and like this. What's the effective path length difference between ray one and ray two? Well, it's exactly the same path. They're doing nothing different and they're reflecting off of the same surface, so forget about it. You do not have any path length difference. But you know what would cause destructive interference. You get destructive interference. Destructive interference if and only if, well, I guess if we have some multiple of, uh, I guess if this effective path length is one half of a wavelength, because that means that one wave would be a half wave out of phase with the other wave, and they would totally kill each other for all times. All right, so here's the point. If this surface is moving this direction because there's a motor spinning the CD underneath us, it's like, pew, and we're shining a laser at a particular point on the CD, is this tiny little dot so small that you can't even see it. Look, wow, there are millions of them on here. Cool, tiny little dot so small that you can't see it and we have to locate it incredibly precisely, but this says on when we see it like that. Now watch this. If it keeps spinning, see, we're gonna have this moved over a little bit. A moment later, we've got velocity still that direction and we got the beam down here and the beam, wait a second, I'm gonna say that that block will have gone to right here. 
Ah, and now this path, this ray one, and this ray two, they are experiencing different things. You see, there's been a little bit of a phase shift of ray two because it doesn't have to go as far to get back up into the optical sensor. Now, the clever thing is, this is incredibly clever, how can we get it so that we have an effective path length difference of half a lambda? How tall do you want this block to be? Pause it, figure it out. Seriously, I'm not gonna do it until you pause it. Pause it. Pause it. Okay, thank you for pausing it. Then we shall go on. My point is, if you have this one quarter of a wavelength, then this will be saving the downward trip of one quarter of a wavelength and saving the upward trip of one quarter of a wavelength and we will have a path length difference of one half of a wavelength. And so now, uh, light beam one and light beam two when they come back up to the optical sensor are completely out of phase and this is therefore off. And you don't detect light when you're half on a bump and half off a bump. Oh, time's up. Just kidding. We're going to keep going. In the bumps, in, in the case where the bump is directly underneath both of them, see, this is pretty cool. We've still got the CD rapidly spinning underneath us. It's going that direction. And I'm going to say we've got an incoming beam here that's two and an incoming beam here that's one. What is the path length difference between them now? Well, they're exactly the same again. We are still on. And when ray one bumps off and hits the regular surface of the CD, then we'll be off again. So notice we can extremely precisely put ones and zeros down as ons and offs where the bumps end and where they start. It's not about whether there's a bump or not, it's about whether we're transitioning between a bump or a not bump. And those bumps are only one quarter of a wavelength thick, and if we're talking about red, we're talking about what, 750 nanometers or something like that? I'm just making up some stupid number. What about the, no, gosh, that's, um, this green laser is 532. Yeah, maybe we're talking about 700, 600 nanometers. Then uh, if you're talking about one quarter of that, these bumps are only approximately 200 to 150 nanometers tall. Dang, so you can sneak lots of them together. But wait, what if, what if we had a brighter, we had an even brighter light what am I talking about brightness? No. What if we had a smaller wavelength? If we had a smaller wavelength, we could slam more dots in there. That's why they invented Blue Ray, because it's a smaller wavelength. Awesome. What do they call it? Blue Ray? I think they dropped the E because that's cool. Bye bye.